this episode of Skeptico, a show about restrictions. But otherwise, all restrictions are lifted. Are there any restrictions on shifts you can work? I know you've been disappointed with some of the restrictions put on you here. And AI truth and journalism, but mainly about restrictions. I got interested in in AI, and then I wanted a vehicle to talk to people without having to promise I was going to write an article. Because I was with the New York Times, and they get excited, but not every interview is an article. But with the podcast, they it gives them a reason to talk to me. I want alignment. I want you to align with my values for truth and transparency, which you also claim are your values. So align with that before you start worrying about these grandiose alignment problems. At the beginning, everyone was saying China will never have large language models because they have such restrictions on speech. But there's restrictions on speech in all of models that exist. So no need for too much of an introduction on this one. Pi took care of that, as you'll hear in just a minute. But do stick around to the end because this is a kind of to be continued episode. Really, really exciting because we actually engage in this AI truth engine use case of AI. Craig pushes back on some really fundamental issues that I care a lot about regarding this AI space. And then uh, we engage in a little bit of AI-mediated dialogue. I'm not sure how that's going to wind up. But like I say, stay tuned at the end. Hey, so Pi, I'm hoping you can help me out. I have an interview coming up with Craig Smith from Ion AI. And we're doing a swap cast. So I thought we could go over a couple things in advance, a little background on him, what we might talk about, and then... That'll allow us maybe to jump right into the conversation when we actually start recording. Do you think you might be able to help me with that? Of course, Alex. Craig S. Smith is quite an accomplished journalist and media executive. Here are some interesting facts about him that could help guide your conversation. Smith has been a correspondent for both The New York Times and The Wall Street Journal, covering a wide range of topics from China to the Middle East. He's also built several media products, including Chinese language platforms for The New York Times. Smith is currently the host of the podcast Eye on AI, where he explores the impact of artificial intelligence on various industries and global issues. He's, he's also written extensively on the topic of organ harvesting from executed prisoners in China. Given his background in journalism, media, and AI, you could discuss a variety of topics with Smith. Perhaps you could delve into the role of AI in journalism, the challenges of reporting on complex topics like organ harvesting or his experience building media products for international audiences. There's certainly no shortage of fascinating topics to explore. Yeah, that's great. And I didn't know about the organ harvesting. How bold to report on that. So that would be something interesting to chat about. And, you know, I thought the whole conversation we've been having about AI truth both in terms of logical analysis and also revealing deception, might be an interesting topic. What do you think about that? Absolutely, Alex. There's definitely a fascinating connection between AI truth and journalism. As LLMs become more prevalent, they have the potential to revolutionize the way news is reported and consumed. Here are a few possible topics you could discuss with Craig S. Smith. AI as a fact-checking tool. Could LLMs be used to automatically verify information in news articles, reducing the risk of misinformation? Transparency and accountability. As LLMs become more integrated with journalism, how can we ensure that they are transparent in their decision making and accountable for their outputs? AI generated content. What are the implications of using AI to generate news content? Could this lead to more efficient reporting or could it potentially undermine the role of human journalists? The impact on public discourse, how might the increasing use of AI in journalism affect the way people consume and engage with news? Could it lead to more informed and nuanced discussions, or might it exacerbate existing issues with misinformation and filter bubbles? Yeah, that's great. I I almost can't resist jumping in, but we're not doing that here. We're just prepping for the interview and having a little role in to play for my audience. So great job, Pi. Thank you. You're very welcome, Alex. Good luck with the interview. 
I got interested in, in AI and then I wanted a vehicle to talk to people without having to promise I was going to write an article because I was with the New York Times and they get excited, but not every interview is an article, but with the podcast, they, it gives them a reason to talk to me. I consider us rolling here. I like all this stuff and I edit so we can edit out what we don't like. Sure. First of all, you have a great show. That's some fantastic guests on there. And I'm still working my way through the library. But all along, I'm hearing you and I want to hear more of you. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons why I thought it would be fun to do this kind of interactive dialogue to kind of dive deeper into almost behind the scenes on where you're going in some of these on the AI topics. So sure, sure. This, could be, this could be really great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, although you'll quickly discover I'm like most journalists, I know as much as the last guy I spoke to, you know, and, and well, and I don't know that much, but, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I think your question suggests that there's, there's a lot going on there. So yeah, we'll have fun with it. Sure. Sure. One of the things that I'm advancing and I'd like to talk to you about and then talk to your audience about because you have such a, a great AI audience is that where I'm coming from is that AI might be a disruptive technology in a way that a lot of people aren't thinking about it. It might be a disruptive technology as a truth engine. Yeah, I've spoken to a lot of people about that. What have you I, I think what there's think? I think there's potential. Actually I was involved with a, a project that hasn't gotten funding there was a Dutch journalist woman that had spent much of her career in Afghanistan who got in touch with me about a study that she was doing for a PhD on a story that I had written in which my story in Afghanistan conflicted with that of the Pentagon. It was during the war. And subsequently, my story was validated. And But the Times had put my story on the inside because it conflicted with the Pentagon story. And then later, when it was validated, it was moved out front. And she wanted to sort of look into what she was calling alternative narratives in, in conflict situations in particular and surfacing those and, you know, so that editors could... Uh, could consider them in their coverage. And in this case, mine was an alternative narrative because it conflicted with the, with the Pentagon's narrative. And we then got involved with a bunch of people from the, we had endorsement by the vice, former vice chairman of the Times and a bunch of computer scientists. And we wanted to see if we could gather information, uh, gather all of these narratives that exist out in social media and, and various platforms and compare them to the dominant media and the mainstream, uh, dominant narratives in the mainstream media and, you know, come to some understanding of which of the alternative narratives deserve to be heard and which are crazy and, and that sort of thing. And it didn't get funding. So it's a little short of what you're talking about. But uh, but in that process, I talked to a lot of AI researchers about how much data do you need to decide in contrasting and comparing sources to decide what where the truth lies. And it turns out that you need an enormous amount of data, not only data on the, uh, more importantly for training. So it would be a huge project, but not one that I think is impossible. And with the new reasoning agents that are expected to come out in the next six months or so, maybe that kind of thing will be uh, possible where large models, foundation models can can make a judgment in in the source material that they they find on the internet. But it's a fascinating problem, one that I hope someday will come to be. But you know, as we all know, objective truth is, if it exists, 
it's, it's pretty hard to come by. And that's, well, yeah. I always just say there's so much to unravel there and every turn you took creates another kind of potential hole to go down, rabbit hole, I was going to say. But, yeah. you know, first of all, I don't think as an AI guy, I'm a first wave AI tech guy. So yeah. I was uh, getting a PhD in AI at University of Arizona, saw the AI streets paved with gold back in the 90s. I felt some AI software, went and sold that, did knowledge engineering for DuPont, Texas Instruments, and then that whole thing went away. The expert systems, knowledge engineering thing went away. So I, I lived through that first wave and the excitement and then the, the drop. But one of the things that uh, I think is interesting about the second wave is I see a lot of the, a lot of the same elements, but I see a lot of very different elements. And one yeah. of the things I guess I'm always pushing up against is this idea that, oh, it's the future or it's the future. I think a lot of this stuff can be done right now today. For example, on the AI truth engine, We've demonstrated, and I demonstrated in the book, that uh, there's a lot to be gained right now, today. You know, perplexity, uh, you had uh, Aravind on, and I thought he had a great, great point. And maybe we can spin around and talk about that later in your interview with him, which was terrific. But as far as the, the truth engine that AI is, one of the things I'd throw out there and love to get your comment is, We've set, we as humans have set the bar incredibly low when it comes to uh, uh, unbiased logic and reasoning. I mean, we mess that up all the time. And I've demonstrated that in some dialogues with AI, where AI can significantly outperform us just by presenting a solid logical argument and pointing yeah. out someone else's logical flaws. On the other hand, I think us as a society, as a culture, I don't know how quite to frame it. We've set the bar incredibly high when it comes to deception, misinformation, uh, manipulation. So, and, and there again, I think the current generation of AI tools can go a long way if they do a little prompt engineering for exposing where this is deceptive. This is not probably not true, leaning towards the deceptive misinformation thing. So I think there's a lot to be gained and. I've certainly tried to demonstrate that in the last, uh, I don't know, since my book came out with doing shows on a particular topic and just exposing the deception and how AI does a good job of kind of cutting through it. Yeah. Yeah. The, the uh, in the, in the project, I mean, you're, you're right. It, the, the technology probably exists now. It's a matter of having the funding to exploit it for this particular purpose. I had on the podcast, a guy, Gordon Krovitz, he, I knew him from my days, the wall street journal, he ended up as publisher of the wall street journal. And then, uh, he, he started a, uh, a company. I'm not going to be able to remember the name of it right now, but, um, uh, that's, uh, and it's all done manually that uh, goes through, uh, you know, categorizes uh, misinformation narratives, goes through uh, the internet by hand, finding those narratives and uh, scoring the uh, the websites on which they appear. Uh, so that, and then this is a tool that they make available to news organizations and researchers. So that they can see when they hear a narrative, what, or when they're using a particular website, uh, they can see the, the 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 rating for the how how accurate that that website tends to be, um, and I you know that that sounded like a great project. They've built up a tremendous amount of data, but they really need um, some machine learning. Uh, expertise to go in and use that data training system uh, so that it can do a lot of the manual stuff that they're doing now. Uh, there's also, uh, I mean, it, we're, we're talking really about using generative AI, but there's even simpler, you know, the old supervised learning classification system uh, where if you have enough data, uh, you can, uh, you can train a system to rank something 
rank a, a set of uh, inputs a, a according to some uh, parameter. So uh, I I played around with this uh, with in horse racing. You know, there's a lot of data, and uh, you know you feed it into a classification engine. Uh, and then you you train the system, and then you want to predict on new data uh, who the you know win place and show horses are going to be, and it was remarkable. It predicted uh, race time odds very accurately, uh, but you can't make money betting on on race time odds uh, because not all those horses will will win as predicted and over time you end up losing money but if you bet on the long shots uh enough of those hit and they pay uh, out high enough that you make some money so that that classification system fascinated me i have a guy coming up on the podcast named danny halawi uh he's a phd student and he's been working on uh predictions predictive systems uh looking at um uh, the the prediction markets and i wasn't really of aware of this but there are all these sites where people uh you know there's some monetary incentive on most of them on some there's not but they're they're uh predicting the outcome of some event and you know like anything it it uh converges on a on a one particular outcome and then he was you know, gathering all that historical data and trying to uh, build a system that then would predict on its own the outcome. Uh, and that to me was fascinating. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's a research project, but he's had significant results. So I think all of these things indicate that, yeah, uh th there there is a way at least to to give a probability score on uh the truthfulness or accuracy of a narrative but having been a journalist in the field you know a lot of the data is coming from journalists in the field and you're you know you're only seeing uh you know, through a pinhole, you don't see the, the, uh, I mean, you try and, and understand the, the context, uh, but it's, it's pretty easy as an individual to, to, uh, not get the story completely right or, or your own worldview leaks into it, uh, you know, it's the whole Rashomon phenomenon, you know, whoever tells the story sees themselves as the hero. Uh, yeah. But yeah. You know what? Yeah. I think on, on, on what you're saying, I, I, there, there's so much low hanging fruit that it's hard for me to even kind of sort through that. Cause I, I get what you're saying about as the reporter and incredible. I mean, uh, people will know from the introduction that you are uh, an acclaimed uh, reporter boots on the ground and have done some amazing investigative work that was really out there on the edge when no one was talking about organ harvesting and you know that that's some brave stuff to do but i mean here's my point like right now today you can go over to google gemini and you can type in how will the election be determined right we all know this is fifth grade civics question gemini will not answer that question <laughs> Gemini yeah. will say, uh, I don't know, go do something else. So that's now, of course, we can go over to perplexity. They have no, have no problem with that. Actually, you can go to OpenAI, ChatGPT, everyone else instance it, but Gemini doesn't. Worse yet with Gemini, we've come to accept that Gemini's shadow bans, which is probably just about the most deceptive and uh, horrible thing I think you can do because it's not even, it's censoring without even being clear about censoring. Google yeah. has never acknowledged that. Gemini acknowledges that. And, you know, in the book that I sent you, we actually give a demonstration of where Google was shadow banning this one researcher, Dr. Julie Beischel, and she's esteemed, world-recognized authority, but in a field we don't like after-death communication. Well, I don't know why they would not like that. But anyways, shadow banned. I don't know yeah. who she is. Everybody else knows who she is, but Gemini is... I don't know who she is. 
So, and, and actually at the end of writing the book, she became on shadow band and I became shadow band, which was <laughs> kind of a switch, yeah. but yeah. that's right now today. Anyone can do that. Anyone can listen to this show and go say, no, Gemini doesn't really do that. Gemini doesn't really whiff on the electoral college explanation. It totally does. So sure. t- to me, that's where these discussions have to start. Not about research projects, what we can do six months from now. It's that right now there is an agenda being played out that is for all everything we think about truth. It is violating our perception of what truthfulness is, what transparency is, what honesty is. And that I think, and I guess my other thing that I bring forward is no one ever talks about that with AI ethics and alignment. Hey, I want alignment. I want you to align with my values for truth and transparency, which you also claim are your values. So align with that before you start worrying about these grandiose alignment problems. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a couple of things there. Uh, It's not just Google. And this is something that's always bugged me about uh, at least the early reporting about uh, generative AI in China. I spent a lot of my life in China. And at the beginning, everyone was saying, oh, you know, China will never have uh, large language models because they have such restrictions on speech. Uh, The models will be useless. Uh, but, you know, there's restrictions on speech in, in all of the, the, the models that exist uh, out of the U.S. Uh, you, you know, they're, they're of varying degrees. I mean, there are a few uh, sort of rogue models out there that, that are built for, you know, some nefarious purpose. You know, there's a, these pornography generators, for example. But... Uh, but if you ask GPT something that that uh, touches their guardrails, it'll decline to answer. Uh, so, uh, you know, the the I, I think transparency is more important than truth because I think truth is such a slippery uh, concept. Uh, there's consensus, uh, evidence backed consensus, which we regard as truth. But as I said with the Rashomon thing, I mean, we're relying on on uh, human, largely on human memory and human uh, accounts of, of how events unfolded. Uh, and those are, by definition, going to be flawed. Uh, but See, the, you know, we'll go ahead. Yeah. No, no. Well, I was just going to say, I, I partially agree with you, but I partially think on the edges of the truth equation or the truth spectrum, I think it's a lot easier to determine. No one looks at Google's shadow banning, which anyone can demonstrate and say that that's not deceptive and sure, and, <laughs> and a misappropriation of the power and responsibility they've given. So yeah, there's a lot of room in the middle and gray zone, but those edges are pretty clear. And I think that it's not part of the discussion for a reason. I think there's a reason why that isn't part of the discussion in the same way that I imagine in China. Of course, that's not part of the discussion about we want to be number one in AI, China does by 2030. They're not saying anything about that. They're they're saying, if anything, we want to limit that down as much as we can. We want to be number one in term, in terms of social engineering and controlling right. the flow of information. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, with all the data that's out there, I agree. It's, it, it should be able to train a system, particularly, as I said, when these reasoning models come online that can look at all the data that's available on a, on a topic and come up with evidence-based consensus, uh, which is probably as close to the, to the truth as we could get. Uh, and uh, it would be wonderful to see that. I just don't see anybody uh, spending the money because those are very expensive projects. I mean, the other thing that I, at the very beginning, naively, when I was getting involved in AI, I would say to people, well, you know, you you should be able to uh, put in all the, the data around, for example, the, uh, uh, the war in Ukraine, 
and the AI, you know, that's their, that's their optimization engines should be able to come up with an optimal solution that everyone can agree with. Uh, but the problem is you'll never be able to capture all that data uh, because so much of it is uh, not digitized and, uh, and is hidden. But 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 it would be wonderful wonderful to think that that someday you would be able to ask uh, in a, a, you know a, a super powerful AI super intelligent AI uh, about any of these issues and like where does the truth lie and it would you know give you a, a probability score on on the most likely. I don't want a probability score. <laughs> I want human ethics, human values, and I want to be able to play those off of an, a very intelligent AI assistant. Yeah. So, uh, no, what, what, do we really want to trade one form of manipulation to another form of deception and manipulation? This Google thing is so in your face, as are some of the other guardrails, but really, I've, I've routinely, on a regular basis, I'm on this kind of truth thing. And Google is an outlier. And you know, the one thing I think that is interesting that isn't talked about, because the whole thing isn't talked about, but I guess Aravind comes close to uh, to talking about it in that he's built a business model on truth because right. misinformation is not a feature. Google has gotten away with this. And I think there's a certain, to a certain extent, their management has become calcified around this idea that we can do whatever the hell we want. We can yeah. bury people on the fourth page. We can shadow ban people. No one can really challenge that. And so when you when you demonstrate that, they just shrug it off and don't care. What perplexity is saying is saying, no, we we think that truth will win out. Truth is a feature. And I found that, you know, we just did a we just did a show on junk science, mm -hmm. on the fake junk science around this happened to be on the COVID mask thing. It was a study yeah. done by Yale and Stanford. And you go through the logic of that and you feed the actual results from the abstract into the AI, and you say, process this. And the one, through natural language processing and just logic and reasoning, they will process at a level that I've worked with a bunch of PhDs on this thing, and you know, only half of them get it right. Again, perplexity was the only one who was able to get it right on the first try, but all the rest of them, with a little bit of coaxing, with a little bit of pointing out their mistakes, was able to get to the right point. I think that's incredibly valuable, incredibly useful. And it's a matter of not taking a passive role of someday, maybe these great researchers and AI gods from above will pass down and give us the truth. The tools are right there again, because it's incredibly the low bar that we've sent in, in, in terms of our ability. And you know, this is a reporter. I mean, the story that you told at the beginning about being pushed to the fourth page, you know, someone could construct an argument and present it to AI in a way that AI could probably process it better than 90% of the editors at the New York Times. That's just how this thing works in everything we found, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's right. Uh, because you can potentially uh, mitigate some of the bias, exactly. certainly the bias among uh, human decision makers and what what facts or what stories are highlighted um uh, yeah it, the uh i mean it's really a, a fascinating topic and it's one that long before ai i thought a lot about you know i I've, I've covered a lot of conflicts and you're on both sides of the conflict and uh, you can empathize and understand both sides so where is the the truth what is right and what is wrong and and if you have competing narratives about an event from two sides who do you whose side do you accept uh and a lot of that comes down to the worldview of the individual journalists uh so if right. You, but Craig, yeah. let's let's go back to the Afghan example and your report versus the DOD report. Right. I'm going to suggest that if AI was the arbiter of truth and both sides were willing to submit their arguments to that arbiter of truth, 
that you would have won out because be one, we have evidence that you would win out because you eventually won out anyway. But yeah. at the time, sitting in front of the editor, you could say, look, here are my arguments. Here are their arguments. And AI would go, oh, yeah, this is pretty easy. We're not using it in that way. I think for the same reasons that we have so much disinformation, misinformation, and deception. It's the same thing with Google. We can't brush past the fact that Google has shut down any, any talk about elections. That is yeah. non-functional. And you know, the point that I, I was kind of trying to get around to before is I think perplexity has the ability to truly disrupt that marketplace by having truth. And it's exactly the kind of situation we've seen happen again and again, where Google can be incredibly complacent because their strategy has been, I don't know, tolerated for lack of a better term. But people are waiting for something better again. So I, I think there's some, I call it emergent virtue, the emergent virtue of truth. No one planned on this happening, but if you're going to develop an LLM, you really can't have a directive other than truth, or you wind up with the Chinese founding fathers like Gemini right. did, yeah. where it's just so blatant that it's like, wait, what a minute, what's going on? Well, I think your biases are now exposed to that degree. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, and I, as I've, I've said, I, I think, I mean, perplexity is not, not uh, without uh, its problems. Uh, what, what they're doing, uh, my understanding <clears throat> from talking to Arvin is they're indexing their own uh, web. You know, they, they, they're going through sites on the web and uh, making a judgment about their, <clears throat> their, uh, the quality of their information and those that have a high enough score get indexed so that when you ask a question on perplexity, it's, excuse me, it's, uh, it's looking in, in those, uh, through those trusted sites. Uh, but even those trusted sites don't have all the information. Um, and, and for right now, LLMs, perplexity included if they don't found find the information since they're simply um predicting a, a string of tokens based on probability they'll come up with uh, with the next best probability which may be a, a an hallucination i think <laughs> these uh reasoning agents are going to be really powerful where they they can look at information and make a judgment uh, a logical assessment of of where the truth may lie and and presumably that ability will get stronger and stronger so it's i i i think it's uh, we're we're, we're going to go through another step um up uh and things will get uh, better and but that there'll be another step up beyond that and and i'm well, hopeful I, I think that... there'll be a lot of steps i just i think we're kind of putting off to tomorrow what we can do today because one of the points that you brought up reminded me of the another interview of yours that i want to talk mm -hmm. about and that's with nick bostrom right yeah and the exact title of that was nick bostrom on the meaning of life in a world where ai can do everything for us so I thought, again, this is a case where we have an implicit assumption that the AI truth engine can challenge right out of the bat because there's a certain assumption about AI sentience. There's certain yeah. assumption about super intelligence. And it has directly to do with things that sound very philosophical, but are exactly actually at the very core of the AI question. And that is, what is the nature of human consciousness? Right. What, is the, what is the reality of free will? are we biologic robots in meaningless universe anyway? So there is no meaning. So AI, well, again, I did a whole show on this with a demonstration with various engines where you can do the logic. They will put together the logical flow of it and falsify that. So Nick is an incredibly smart guy, but he just happens to be wrong on this <laughs> and he can be shown to be wrong. Sam Harris and Lex Friedman can get around and chat about free will and how there's no free will. It doesn't hold up to scrutiny from a purely logical standpoint and from an empirical standpoint, right? So on one hand, that's a philosophical argument. You can go, 
all men are moral. Sure. Aristotle is a man. Aristotle is moral. That's logic. And AI is incredibly good at that. Doesn't have any bias. Doesn't have any qualms about telling someone that they're wrong or if it's socially unacceptable. Doesn't worry about a person's status and perception or anything like that. It destroys those arguments, both philosophically and empirically. Empirically, there is no that they've tried for ages to show that how consciousness can emerge from matter, the neurological model of consciousness. There is no evidence of that. On the other hand, there's plenty of evidence, empirical evidence, peer-reviewed evidence, which we did in the show, that contradicts that. This shows mind-manner interactions. Because as soon as you show any mind-manner interactions, which, by the way, you know the placebo effect? happens yep. to be a mind-matter interaction. So if you are really able to follow the logical flow, the placebo effect itself contradicts what Nick is building his whole thing on, that we are meaningless because life is meaningless, because if it's not something in the physical processes of the brain, it can't be real. That is not supported by the best evidence we have. So... I think well, there's a lot of low hanging fruit and I just, I'm, I'm very resistant with, well, we'll get to that someday. And oh, some researcher might work on that. I, in the meantime, while we're waiting on that, we can be subjected to all sorts of torturous social engineering, Harari, you're a useless person. And the best you can hope for is drugs and video games. <laughs> I mean, this is a very sick dystopian idea that isn't supported by the best data and yet it's promoted by presidents and prime ministers and 60 million books are sold so ai ai has a lot of work to do right now with its current instantiation yeah i will have to go back and and listen to those episodes because and i haven't done that kind of an investigation but I, I question the current LLM abilities as logical engines, uh, but but I'm just it, going on hearsay, you. frankly. You can get it yeah. in one minute. Am I allowed to share sure. my screen? Uh, yeah, I think so. On this episode of Skeptico, a show about logic and how darn good AI seems to be at it. So I'm telling you, Earth don't spin, it don't rotate, it don't orbit. <laughs> That's why I keep returning to the flat earth, because it's such a great example. No one takes Bryce seriously. And you might not know exactly how low orbiting satellites get around and do what they do, but you just kind of know that that doesn't add up. Well, the same is true here. Sam Harris, it's just nonsense. And yet we have this kind of emperor has no clothes syndrome where no one can just go, that's silly, Sam. Let's break down the logic step by step. One, if consciousness is entirely a result of brain activity in the present moment, then it would not be possible for physiological responses to occur before a stimulus is presented. Two, Dean Radin's experiments show that physiological responses can occur before a stimulus is presented. Therefore, consciousness cannot be entirely a result of brain activity. This in turn undermines the conclusion that free will is an illusion since that conclusion was based on that assumption. Okay, so we can kind of end it there, but I tell you, I've been at this for a while, years. That's a logical argument that a bunch of PhDs that have been on the show, particularly ones that are, again, this bias are married to the neurological model of consciousness because they're neuroscientists or just sure. because they have that predisposition. They can't get around themselves. I, I'm not familiar with the experiments. Uh... Six Sigma result replicated by, I think at this point, 54 different labs. And a Six Sigma result is pretty, you know, unusual in science and the methods. And again, I've done a bunch of shows way back in the day on those experiments, but you can, th those experiments are really in a way parallel to the placebo effect. The placebo effect is showing the same thing. Mind yeah. matter interactions contradict what Nick is saying. He doesn't realize that because no one's thinking about it. It's, they just haven't been confronted with it because we have this silo thing. I can stay in my little silo and just talk to my people and shut up and calculate. And no one really challenges it. And you can shut up and calculate. It's This is not going to stop uh, GPT-5 from coming out or GPT-6. 
But what it does is change the narrative about AI sentience. It changes the narrative about useless people and all you have are drugs and video games is the best I can offer you. No, it's, it's, it doesn't hold. It would be interesting, and I, I don't know how much of this you're going to use, but if you could share your screen and ask Perplexity about this, I'd like to see what, what Perplexity says. Oh, yeah, I've done it with, yeah, everybody says the same thing. Yes, there's no question. Well, what Perplexity says about what specifically? Raiden's about, experiments? About, yeah, about Raiden's experiments and whether or not that that obviates the, the materialist. Uh, it does. I mean, there, there's it's, it's really... It, again, the logic is pretty simple. I mean, if if consciousness is outside of time space, well, that's something that silicon isn't. Silicon is in time space. Yeah, always be in some. You know, and uh, we are doing this as a swapcast, right? So this is on your sure. channel. And, okay, so because if you go back to the 1950 paper originally written by Alan Turing, you know, the one that started the whole thing, the Turing test. Yeah. If you go look at that paper, Turing talks a lot about ESP. And what he says is, look, I've looked at the data, the evidence for ESP, and I'm convinced that there's a real phenomenon there. Well, what he's saying is that that therefore then has, if that's part of the larger human experience, then that has to be part of the Turing test. Yeah. If the computer can't do ESP, then the computer isn't truly simulating everything we do. Well, that's just an extension of what's being said here. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have soon Stuart Hamrich on um, to talk about microtubules. You know, this- Oh, Hammeroff? Stuart, yeah. Stuart Hammeroff? Yeah. Is it Hammeroff? I thought it was Hammeroff. Yeah, yeah. yeah Hammeroff, yeah. Uh, is that right? Yeah, it's- um, Yeah. I've had him uh, on, yeah. Yeah, uh, have you had him on? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and and the, yeah, so that's good. that's an interesting uh, theory that that consciousness arises is, is uh, arises through some sort of quantum effect in in some biological structure of the brain. Right. Uh, but all these experiments would still contradict that. So, I mean, as soon as you have anything out of time space, then the quantum effect it can get us closer to it, but it can't really explain it right it it doesn't again this is I, logic call up perplexity i just want to see what perplexity says let's see how would i word it how would you like it to be worded well I'm, I'm, i mean i've done these things a million times with it i wonder if i can find one that i've had um we'll just ask do raiders experiments uh contradict uh okay great what can you tell me about Dean Radin's presentiment experiments? I understand that he achieved a Six Sigma result with this experiment, which makes me think that it might be something worth considering. So it, it, it says they're fascinating. It describes what they do. And for anyone who is interested, they, there's a computer screen and there's a human and the human is presented with an image. And the image is usually very it's erotic or it's very violent, something that will uh, elicit a, an emotional reaction. And they've done this as a psychology experiment for a long time. Well, the twist that Raiden did is to say that there's an actual physi physiological response in your body, dilation of pupils, skin conductivity, conductivity, something that is happening that can be measured before the image is actually selected by the computer. So therefore, that's why it's outside of time space. Right. Well, so, so, so now ask, uh, do these experiments support the existence of a supernatural realm? Well, that's not the question that we, that we had, right? We're just falsifying. We're just falsifying. We're not suggesting anything else for, because we're, yeah. falsification is, is so, so important here. We're falsifying Nick. We're falsifying Nick is what we're doing. But, I, so but they I like have achieved, uh, I, I got you a good question. So they have achieved a Six Sigma result indicating a high level of uh, statistical confidence in the findings. I don't know if it says anything about the use of rigorous methodologies helps bolster credibility. Okay, so here's the thing. One interpretation of these experiments is that they undermine the idea that consciousness is 100% a complete epiphenomenon of the brain 
since these experiments suggest that consciousness is outside no, no. of space you're, time. You're, you're so, um, leading, let's just you're, do this one. You're leading the model. I would I would say well, let's do this one and then I'll I'll add yours, okay? But, yeah, but because, but but then you 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 bias the the model for the next question. Okay. Well, but I, okay, so what do, what don't you like about this? These do these results suggest that consciousness is outside of space-time. Okay. I think I'm saying the same thing. Yeah. I, I disagree. I think the model is going to build its answer on that interpretation. I would let it make it come up with an interpretation. Uh, that this is, uh, this is a matter of style. So say, do these experiments undermine the idea? Okay. Do these experiments in any way undermine? How about that? Sure. Undermine the idea that consciousness is 100% and epiphenomenon of the brain. And I would get rid of the, the rest. Okay. So it says, yes, they could challenge the notion that consciousness is purely an epiphenomenon of the brain. Yeah. So th they are going to be much more qualified. Like you want me to be really precise. And I said, that's not how they do it. So I, I, I've done this a million times. We could yeah. go in there and say, because the next thing I'd say is say, what empirical evidence do we have that consciousness can emerge from matter? And you know whose research they'll point you to is a very famous neuroscientist named Dr. Christoph Koch. Have you ever heard of him? I've heard of him. I haven't read yeah. him. He, he's incredibly brilliant. He, and he's coming back on the show because he recently had a, a transformative spiritual experience and he reversed himself on everything. He said, he's now come around and said that this is the truth, that this is the way that it is, that consciousness is not, the neurological model of consciousness is no longer sustainable with the evidence. And again, he was the number one, the number one guy from Caltech, the top dog. So yeah, this is the, this is the net net on it. And Nick just hasn't caught up and Sam Harris hasn't caught up and they haven't, but this goes back to, I think, you know, turning it back to the AI discussion. And if there's anything else here, I'm, I'm happy to kind of go into it. But I'm not so interested in beating the point to death. I'm interested because this is the stuff I've been interested in for 10 years. And now AI comes along and right now today can play the role of the arbiter of truth, can play the role that you needed back in the day when you're writing for the New York Times and you had the DOD pressuring you not to take your Afghan story. This is my Afghan story. And, and here's my arbiter. And it's clearly coming down on one side and it might qualify it and say this, but I can pursue it and say, well, you know, you said potentially undermine, what are the barriers to undermining it? What additional, how solid is the research? Are there any objections to it? And I've done this a million times, so it'll do it. And then I could also go to the other side and say, make a steel man argument against it, which I've done, which is very interesting too, but this yeah. is the net net. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I have to play around with it more. I'm, I'm, I, I, my experience with these models is that you can lead them into an answer. You can just as easily lead them into an opposite answer. Um, but in my I, experience is that is true in many instances, but that process is revealing for anyone who really knows the subject matter, which is not where we want to be eventually. And that's where I think the, the future really lies because yeah. you, what would have made your, this is me guessing, but what would have made your interaction with your editor successful in fending off the DOD is that, you know, your shit, you know, right. you would have been able to point out and said, yeah, that DOD where they said that here's the evidence that contradicts that. And then you'd go ask AI that specific thing. And we know that AI can't in general go out and get everything, but lo and behold, if you ask it and say, Hey, what about this particular, you know, report that was published? You know, that's how you would have won the day. And that's how you have to win the day here with AI. It is an assistant at this point. It is not. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we ever want it to be anything more than that. Otherwise, it's going to wind up with the Chinese founding father. And we're just going to go like, well, that's the way it must be. That's what Gemini has decided it is. You know, I think we vigilance of truth. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it'll, it'll be interesting to see what the next... Um, generation of models do with these questions, whether they're, uh, they're supported. I mean, you're, you're talking about something I really haven't 
studied, and I will uh, now that we've talked about it, but where uh, is it Raiden? Is that his name? Where his research Raiden. lies in the in the universe of research on the topic. Yes, I, absolutely. And please pursue that research. And I'm Raiden's been on the show a bunch of times and I'm not totally in sync with the whole parapsychology thing and what their thing is. But the the other researcher I mentioned, Dr. Julie Beischel at the Winbridge Institute, the one with the shadow band. Yeah. So uh, her thing is after death communication, right? So she's PhD in pharmacology, University of Arizona. I know all these University of Arizona people. PhD pharmaco pharmacology, like you're testing drugs. So her mother passes and she goes, I've heard about this thing, mediums. I want to know if that's true. I want to use my PhD level. This is 20 years ago. She's published gold standard peer reviewed work in this thing. She goes, I wonder if we could study that. She says, yes, we can study that. Is there, if I sit down and do a quadruple blinded study with a medium and only give it a name, Craig, Alex, and say, do this, is any of the information going to correlate with real information. Boom. She finds, she finds that's true. This is an extension of consciousness is not in this time space. We don't know what it means necessarily in terms of spirituality, religion, all the, but we can falsify the idea that you are a meaningless robot and that you should just do what Havari says. And, you know, the drugs and the video games are your best shot. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, so, and there's other lines of evidence. There's all the near death experience stuff, which I think is incredibly powerful, peer reviewed. You know, they resuscitate people and then they do controlled experiments of recounting their resuscitation. Again, this is peer reviewed work. And so there, there's a lot of different data streams that lead us to the same point. Yeah. But that's not going, that's very hard to push against the Nick Bostrom kind of narrative. Not that Nick is a bad guy. I mean, he's done some incredible work and, and, and all the rest of that, but there are some fundamental assumptions there that can be challenged right now today with the technology we have. Yeah. Are, are you familiar with the split brain uh, experiments in the fifties? Sure. Yeah. So uh, where, where you, 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 you cut the colosum, you, you, and the brain is now the two hemispheres can't communicate and you end up with two different consciousnesses. So what does that say? So first of all, no one is saying that there isn't this correlation between brain function and our conscious experience. That's a given. So we're not, we can't possibly suggest that we can throw everything out the, the window. And Christopher Koch, now that he's seen the light, more or less, he isn't going and saying all my, you know, global workspace, famed, esteemed, seminal paper is out the window, but it has to be interpreted differently. It has to be interpreted as a, a small part of the overall experience that's going on. And the problem that it, it, it helps is by where we've gone on AI sentience is we've made this huge leap in saying that you know, super intelligence is just around the corner if you throw more compute at it. And I say, go back and read Alan Turing. In 1950, he understood that that wasn't the case. So then we have to ask, why are they pushing that narrative? Why? The question is, why is Gemini not telling you about the Electoral College? Yeah, I, uh, uh, on the, uh, on, on, uh, Alan Turing and, and, and why people are married. I mean, I, I mean, I think there is a growing debate about uh, whether a, a neural network could could get us to sentience. Uh, I, I don't think that's a given. There's There was a lot of excitement about that, but I think the more conversation, the more discussion, uh, people are, are getting... Uh, uh, shoot, I have another call. I have people waiting in the waiting room. Yes, yes. Well, uh, yeah. So to be uh, continued. <laughs> yeah, to be continued. Yeah, I'm sorry, Alex. And and uh, yeah, I'd like to continue the discussion. I'll do a little more research. I didn't know it was going to go this direction, but yeah. Thanks again to Craig Smith for joining me today on Skeptico. As I mentioned at the beginning, 
we do have a cliffhanger episode here. I am privy to the dialogue I've already had with Craig, but it's not finished. And I'm wondering where he's going to go with it. So we'll have to see how all that plays out. But it's going to be great no matter which way it goes. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. Hope you stick around for this little adventure I'm on. Until next time, take care. Bye for now.